If you, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open with me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I hear pages turning. I'm for Bibles being on phones too. I'm for, for that too, but I'm kind of a book guy. I like to hold a book. Are you there? Yeah. Matthew 14. I'm going to read starting in verse 22 and just remain seated for right now. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, this was a big crowd because they, he just finished feeding 5,000 plus people. That's a big crowd. And he dismisses the crowd. Verse 23, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. You better be careful what you pray for. <laughs> Amen. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And of course, then in verse 34, they crossed on over and they got to where they were going. Would you stand with me if you're able and let me pray over what we're doing and pray over this service? Father, we thank you that we can still come into your house on the Lord's day and worship you. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We invite your spirit to be here manifestly present. I pray, God, that your word will not return void and that your anointing would be upon me as I preach your word and that your anointing would be upon those who hear. And I pray, Father, that you will have your will in our lives as we grow in our faith and strive to be more Christ-like minister to each one who hears this message. It is in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. God bless you. I used to have a set of prints of paintings. It was a series of four paintings by an artist named Thomas Cole. I think it was from 1842. And the series of these four paintings the series was titled The Voyage of Life. And the four paintings are of a person on a voyage sailing down a river as this voyager passes through four stages of life that are depicted in various ways along the river. The four paintings are titled Childhood, Youth, 
uh, manhood and old age. And so in, in, in the first one, and I've asked Chris to help us see these so that I don't just, you don't just go by my description, but in the first one titled Childhood, the traveler is just a baby laying in a boat, coming out of a, a dark cave and sailing into the light with beautiful vegetation along the banks of the river. And there's this angel, this sort of a guardian angel that stands in the boat with the baby, standing over the child, protecting the child. And then in the second painting, <clears throat> titled Youth, you see the voyager as a young man, maybe a teenager, standing in the back of the boat as if he is guiding his own boat toward a castle-like image in the sky. And the banks are lined with luscious vegetation and the angel is standing there on the bank of the river with an arm outstretched pointing the way that he should go. And then in the third painting, titled Manhood, we see the skies have grown dark the bank of the river is lined with large rocks and dead trees, and there are troubled waters ahead as the voyager who is now a grown man stands in the boat with his hands clasped as if praying and his face turned upward toward a dark sky. And you can see what appears to be an angel standing behind him up in the, up in the clouds looking down, no longer in the boat with him and no longer along the bank pointing the way. And the voyager seems to be earnestly praying as his life approaches the troubled waters just ahead. And then in the fourth painting titled Old Age, you can see that the waters are smooth again, they're calm but the banks are dark and sort of bare of vegetation. The voyager who is now sitting down in the boat with white hair and you see the dark sky that has opened up in front of him and there are these beams of bright light shining down and his hands are clasped in front of him as if in thanksgiving. And there are these angels that are showing him the way through the dark clouds toward this light shining down from above, leading him heavenward. The Voyage of Life. What, a, what a, an incredible series of, of paintings that depict the journey that we take as we travel through this life. And those are some of my favorite, that's some of my favorite artwork right there. And if, if I ever build a big church, I'd love to have a, a, an art gallery of such paintings that have some spiritual significance or meaning that people could go through and reflect and think and praise God and worship God. You know, many of us can look at those four paintings and we can relate. We can see exactly where we've been. We can see where we're going. We can see what's coming next. And the older I've gotten, I think the more I really appreciate those paintings. And I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of sailing through the storms. Sailing through the storms. And I'll tell you something just to start with about myself that I don't know if you know, and it's that I love a good storm. I love a good storm, one that you know has that slow, steady rain and the occasional rumble of thunder in the distance. I love a good storm, but at the same time, I don't care very much for bad storms. I said I love a good storm. And life has both. Some storms are good. They, they seem to just blow you in the right direction. They seem to blow the clutter out of your life and the junk and clear the air. But there are 
some storms that are just bad. They come out of nowhere unexpectedly. They just begin to beat against you and threaten to sink you. And the Bible is full of storm stories. And this isn't the first time I've preached on a storm story in the Bible. Uh, one of the stories that always amazes me every time I read it is the story in the Old Testament where uh, God's people are in battle and God sent a hailstorm. And in this hailstorm, these, in, these enormous hailstones fell on the heads of the enemy of God's people and somehow missed God's people. The Bible says more people fell and died by those hailstorms than they did by the sword that day. Wow. Go God. Hallelujah. Um, the Bible even pictures God in terms of a storm theophany, a theophany being just a, a visible manifestation of God. And the Bible even describes God as appearing in terms of a very powerful and destructive storm. In fact, uh, last week I preached a sermon titled Unshaken. How many of you got to hear that or, or see that? And <clears throat> I talked about two builders who built two houses on two different foundations and the storm came to both houses and beat against them. And in that message, I even went on to talk about a storm in the very next chapter um, where Jesus was sleeping on the boat as the boat was taking on water. But I want to point out that the story I read to you this morning from Matthew 14 is a different story. It's not the same story as that one because this time he's not in the boat with them in this storm. They're by themselves. And this story just seems to speak to more than just the fact that he can calm the storm because there are a whole lot of things that take place in this storm story before he ever calms the storm in this case. Uh, the story seems to speak to sort of the very essence of life and how we, how we make it through life as we sail through the storms that are inevitable in this life. And so <clears throat> wherever you are this morning <clears throat> on your journey, I want us to climb into this boat with these disciples for a few minutes. And I want you to, I want to, I want to help you. I want to sort of put you and me in that boat and imagine that we're literally there with them for a few minutes. I want to show you how we survive the storms that we sail through along the way. And I want us to sail through this storm together. I want to show you five things that <clears throat> we need to remind ourselves of when we're sailing through storms. And if, you're, if you are one to take notes, these are five things that you can write down and when you sail through the storms, you can say these out loud to yourself to help you get through it. And so these are five things that help us to rest assured that we will sail through the storms safely to the other side. So the first thing I want you to hear is this. I want you to see that Jesus brought you here to this storm. In verse 22 of the story that I read, I, I want you to see those words that Jesus made them get into the boat and go ahead of him. Now, there, there's, a, there's a commonly held belief that is not true, and I believe it's held by a lot of Christians who I'm convinced do not even know or realize that they hold this belief. But it is a belief 
that becomes evident when they sail through the storms. It is the belief that if I live my life for Christ and if I'm obedient to the will of God, that will mean that I will have smooth sailing through this life. And most Christians, I think, that have that belief may not even realize they have that belief until the storm comes. And, and, and you may not know that until you sail through the storms and you feel disillusioned, you feel confused, and you're, you're kind of left wondering, God, why did you allow this to happen in my life? There's two reasons that we pray those kind of prayers, and probably everyone in this room has prayed a prayer like that. At least your pastor has. I've asked God why many times. I had somebody tell me a long time ago, you should never ask God why. I totally theologically disagree. <laughs> One reason we ask God why is because God, what's happening in my life doesn't, doesn't jive with what I believe. That's one reason we, we pray those kind of prayers. But one reason we pray those prayers is because I want to understand your purpose in this. And so I want you to see that it was Jesus who made these disciples get into the boat. I'm telling you that these guys sailed into this storm because they obeyed Christ. They sailed through this storm because of their obedience. They suffered this storm in the will of God. Amen. Don't get me wrong. You can sail through some storms because you're out of the will of God and because you're in disobedience to God. And if you don't believe me, ask Jonah. Amen. But sometimes you sail through storms because you are in the will of God. And there's just no escaping the fact that in this world you will have tribulation and in this life you will sail through storms. Just like the storm that came to both houses, one built on the rock, one built on the sand. And the truth is that sometimes you will find yourself in the middle of a storm because you obeyed Christ and because you are in God's will for your life. But understand that they were safer in the storm, in the will of God, in that boat, than they would have been in the crowd on the land. Because they were in the will of God in the storm. Because it was Jesus who made them get in the boat and told them to sail on to the other side. Now, I know that our natural inclination is to just get out of this storm. But when it is God's will for you to be in the storm, he's probably not going to just lift you out of that storm. I, I mean, you just, you just need to remind yourself occasionally as you sail through life and you sail through the storms, you need to probably say out loud, Jesus brought me here. I am here. I'm going through this because I obeyed Christ and I am in the will of God in this storm. It's been said that we must never judge our security on the basis of circumstances alone. And I could add to that that you never should judge whether you're in the will of God based on how smooth sailing it is. All you have to do is peruse scripture and look at the lives of God's servants and the things that they went through because they were in the will of God. <clears throat> well, Jesus sent them off into this storm. I mean, didn't Jesus know this storm was coming? Well, of course he did. Jesus is never surprised by your storm. Storms can, can come up all of a sudden in your life and come out of nowhere and, and, and beat against you and 
You just need to remind yourself, he sent me here, and he is never surprised by your storm. He knows the forecast of your life. And sometimes God will deliberately direct you into a storm. Well, pastor, that kind of begs the question of why would God deliberately direct my life into such a storm? Why would it be God's will for me to sail through a storm? I mean, after all, hadn't Jesus already tested them in a boat in a storm in chapter 8? Yes, but in that storm, he was in the boat with them. And they didn't do so well with that test, I might add. So this time in the storm, Jesus is not in the boat. They are alone in this storm. And how many of you know that's a much harder test? I mean, as long as you have Jesus in your boat, I don't know about you, but I'm fine. Sleep all you want to, Lord, as long as you're in my boat. But do you know you'll be fine also if he's not in your boat? Those times I'm talking about that you feel like you are totally alone in your storm. Isolation. Do you know that you'll be fine just knowing that Jesus is the one who brought you here and you are in the will of God in this storm? If you're in the will of God in this storm, you're going to be fine. Jesus didn't tell him to go get in the boat and sail out and die. He said, go on and sail to the other side. And so you just need to say out loud, Jesus brought me here. But why does God direct our lives to sail through storms? And I think this is going to answer a question for someone. Why? I get asked that a lot as a pastor. Now, some storms are storms of correction because God uses these to discipline us. Just like Jonah was in a storm because he was out of the will of God, he was disobedient to God, and so God needed Jonah to go through a storm of correction because he needed Jonah to go to Nineveh. God uses storms of correction to bring us back into the will of God. But some storms are storms of perfection. And these are the storms that we sail through because we are in the will of God. Now, what do you think God was doing in the life of Peter, for example, in this storm? God knew that one day he would need someone who didn't just read a book or two about storms to help people get through their storms. Any psychologist, any counselor can do that. But God knew that someday he would need someone who's been through the storms for themselves. Let me say it this way. He knew that one day he would need someone who's walked on water with Jesus to help those who think they can't make it through their storm. So when you go through, when you sail through storms in the will of God, know that it's Jesus who brought you here. He's perfecting you because God doesn't just want you to just tell people about Jesus you, you know and just tell people about how Jesus used to heal people and set people free. No, God wants you to show people the Christ who still heals and sets free and delivers and, and, and can walk on water. God wants you to show people by the power and glory of Christ in your life. You, do, do you know how I know Christ heals? Because I've been healed. And, and how do I know Jesus delivers people? Because I've seen so many people delivered from so many things in my life firsthand. And how do I know that he brings us through storms? Because I've walked on water with him. And the second thing I want to tell you is you sail through the storms. And you might want to remind yourself of this as you go through them. Jesus is praying for you. Amen. You see this in verse 23 and 24 after they left and he dismissed the crowd. He went off 
to a mountainside by himself to pray. Now there is something I want you to see from Mark's account of this same story, this same storm, and it's in Mark 6, beginning in verse 47. I'll read it to you. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. Verse 48 says, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Apparently, from his vantage point, he could see them out there on the water, and he could see that the storm was against them, and they were straining to control that boat. I wonder how long Jesus watched them do that. You're down there in the boat just rowing with all your strength going, God, help me get through this storm. And Jesus is somewhere on the mountainside just kind of like this, just watching and watching and watching and watching and waiting. Now he knows what he's going to do. It's just not time yet. According to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, Jesus feels every burden that we feel. That's biblical. He knows everything we're going through, and he even sympathizes with our weakness, it says. So understand, you will never go through a storm where Jesus cannot see you. God sees everything that you go through in this life. Nothing you ever go through is hidden from God's view. And even when he is not in the boat, he sees. He always sees us and, and always knows our need, even before we express it to him. And while the disciples are struggling in the storm, Jesus is praying for them that they will have the courage and the strength that they need, and they'll have the faith that will not fail in the storm. You get a picture of, of what he's doing. Now, I want, to, I want to tell you something that if you can wrap your mind around this, it will absolutely revolutionize your faith, especially when you're sailing through the storms. It's in Romans chapter 8, and let me just ask you a question. Have you ever been through such a bad storm that you were just so overwhelmed by everything that you just couldn't seem to pray anymore? Me and Brother Max, anybody else? You're just so overwhelmed that you just don't even have the words anymore. You just, you're prayed out. Listen, one of, one of the prayers I've prayed many times in my life is, God, I just, I'm out of words. I don't know how to pray about this anymore, but I put it in your hands. Don't be afraid to answer that question. I've been through some storms that were so tremendous that I prayed and prayed until I just didn't seem to know how to pray anymore. And Paul knew about this kind of storm because in one of his letters, to the Corinthian believers, he said that there was one time in his life when he went through such a hardship, he said that we were under such great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, that we despaired even of life. He said, we literally, I literally felt like it was a death sentence. I didn't think we were going to make it through, but Paul wrote something in Romans chapter 8 that will revolutionize your faith if you can wrap your mind around it. He said two things. One, in verse 26, he said that the Spirit helps us in our weakness and that there are times we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. When you just don't know how to pray anymore, the Holy Spirit will intercede for you and he knows what to pray. Amen. And the second thing he says is in verse 34 where he said that Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. 
Just like Jesus was praying for those disciples, guess what he's doing right now today in your life as you sail through your storm? Guess what Jesus is doing right now? He is literally, according to scripture, standing at the right hand of the Father praying for you. I believe he calls you by name before the Father, asking that the Father will watch over you, protect you, send his angels to help you, lift you up in prayer. He's, he's praying for you by name. I believe that. I want to remind you that Jesus has never prayed a prayer that the Father did not hear and did not answer. Listen, you can ask your friends to pray. And you can ask me, I will certainly pray for you. And I'm glad I have friends who pray for me. I'm thankful I have family who pray for me. I'm grateful for the prayer warriors that lift me up when I'm going through the storms. But when I'm sailing through the storms of this life, I can't think of anybody I'd rather have praying for me than Jesus Christ. Do you understand that, that hell cannot stop his prayers? I mean, we read a story where Daniel prayed and apparently there were demons that interfered with the answer coming. You remember that story? God sent an angel with the answer and demons, fallen angels met him and they did warfare. Now, they, the answer did come, but I, wanna, I got news for you. Jesus literally just turns to the father and says, hey, Todd needs help right now, father. Demons can't hinder his prayer. When Jesus prays, his words have power, and it's the same voice that said, let there be, and there was. And his words cannot be silenced. And when you're sailing through the storms, you need to remind yourself, Jesus is praying for me right now. You may feel like your prayers just may not even ever get answered, but Jesus has never prayed a prayer that went unanswered. Hallelujah. And the third thing I want you to Find assurance in as you sail through the storms is in verse 25, and it's this. Jesus will come to you. Now, sometimes in the storm, it'll seem that God is just far away. And it will seem like he is not really concerned about your storm. But he will always come to us in the storms of this life. Long ago, God spoke to his people through Isaiah the prophet and said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. So imagine that. Imagine that you're on this boat and it's the fourth watch of the night, which is just before dawn. And you've been battling this storm all night long. It's been a long night. You're exhausted. I wonder if any of those disciples were thinking about that last storm they went through in chapter 8, the one where Jesus was sleeping, and how he calmed the winds and the waves, thinking, boy, if only he was here now. But this time... This storm is different because he's not there to wake up. But he will always come. One thing I've learned that I think these disciples learned that night, he doesn't always come when I think it's best for him to come. Jesus is literally off in the distance watching this happen. I mean, he could have immediately gone to them. He didn't even have to go to them. He could have just spoken from where he was and said, peace, be still. But he stood there or knelt there, whatever, and, and was watching this happen, waiting. I've learned that sometimes he waits a while. Jesus waited all night long through the first watch, the second watch, and the third watch, and it wasn't until the fourth watch just before dawn that he came. That's kind of what he did when Lazarus died. Oh, if you would have been here sooner, it wasn't, it wasn't my plan to come sooner. It was my plan to come four days late. 
And Jesus waited until the boat was, the Bible says, already a considerable distance from land. Why does God wait so long to come to us when we sail through the storms? Well, because what God will do for you in your storm is always better and will always bring him more glory in the situation that we're in if he waits until all possibility of human intervention is gone. Just like Jesus waited until Lazarus was four days dead to show us that he is the resurrection and the life, he will also wait to come to us in the storm that we're sailing through to show us that he is king over the storms. We sing that song here at the church that when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you over the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. And I will be still and know that you are God. Sometimes God waits because he wants you to know that it's not because you're a good sailor. It's not because you have a better boat than the next guy. God waits to come to you to reveal his great and awesome majesty and glory when he comes to you in the storm. He may, you may feel like you're alone in the storm. You may think he's forgotten you or abandoned you or somehow for some reason he's, he's just removed his favor from your life. But he wanted me to tell you this morning that he will come. And he always comes to you when you sail through storms but he will come when he knows it's best. And the fourth thing that we need to remind ourselves of is that he will always use the storm to grow you. Certainly one of the things Jesus was working on in these disciples, and I think also in us, was the problem of fear. I mean, we see him command them as he's walking on the water, take courage, don't be afraid, it is I. He wants us to learn how to take courage in him in the storm. Now, a lot of people make much ado about the disciples' response when they saw him walking on the water, it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. But I think the simple way to understand that is they knew people don't walk on water but they believed that ghosts can. I think Jesus just wanted to show them that he can walk on top of what they were afraid of. I don't know if I'm getting this through to you. What are you afraid of in your life this morning? He's not. Everything about this storm story is about growing their faith, and so it is in your life. God never stops. He, he never stops growing our faith. He never lets you. By the way, I want you to understand, he never lets you go through storms just to go through storms. Remember, you go through some storms for correction, like Jonah, but this storm is a storm of perfection. God wants to perfect you through your storms. Jesus knew that one day he would leave them to carry on his work in the earth, of building the church to stand against wickedness and to build his kingdom. And he knew that he needed men of courage, and great faith to stand firm through the storms that would lie ahead. And so to understand how God grows us during storms, at this point in the story, our focus shifts to one disciple in particular, and that's Peter. I've often said I can relate to Peter perhaps more than any of them any other disciple. This is the one who's maybe kind of oversure of himself sometimes. It's a nice way of saying it. He's kind of outspoken, quick to speak and slow to listen sometimes. He's definitely a little wishy-washy. And he often gets criticized for sinking in this story. I like what one theologian said about him sinking in this story. Anybody can sit in the boat and watch, but it takes a person of real faith to leave the boat and walk on the water. So if you identify mostly with Peter, if you've stepped out in faith, 
many times only to find yourself sinking moments later. And I hope it's not just me. Let me just applaud you for getting out of the boat in the first place. Because the critics are always going to be the ones who are sitting in the boat watching. The church world is full of people sitting in the boat and they are experts in faith theology. But while some people talk about their faith and criticize you for sinking, they'll talk about you and how you just need to have more faith. Others will show their faith by what they do. Like, you know, I'm going to get out of this boat. There's just a question we need to ask and answer to help us grow through our storms. Why did Peter sink? He walked on water. But he started to sink. Why did Peter sink? And this question, this is a question that we need to ask in our storms. What is it that will make us start to sink and the answer is in verse 31 when Jesus asked Peter, why did you doubt? God will use storms in your life because he wants you to get to a place where you can go through some stuff and not doubt. Where you can go through some difficulties and still believe this is true. I mean, I've, I've been there in my life. I remember as a young preacher, I remember praying for the sick and I would have prayer lines, and God healed. I mean, I saw miracles. God healed people. And the, I remember when the devil started trying to fight my faith. And it was one time when I was, I was preaching at a church and I was praying for the sick, and I remember as I was about to pray, I was about to give the altar call for anybody who needs healing. And by the way, don't let me forget, Chris, I'm going to pray for your back before you leave. For anybody who needs healing, and you know, just like the Holy Spirit whispers in your ear, boy, that devil can too. And he said, what if you pray for these people and nobody gets healed? I remember as a young preacher standing there kind of struggling with that. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Until I remembered what this says. And I began to pray and I said, God, even if you never heal anybody at my hands, I will still preach that you are the healer because the Bible says, your word says that you heal. God wants you to go through some storms and experience some things and not doubt what his word says. Right. Doubt is one of the things God wants to help us with. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Bid me to come to you. And when he said that, he used a Greek word that refers to the command of a king. He, he is saying, Lord, command me what to do. God, I don't know what to do in this. I don't know what to do this time, so I need you to tell me. Command me what I should do. And when God speaks to you, when he tells you, or when he commands you, you can do it. And sometimes in, in our storms, that's the prayer we need to pray. God, I don't know what to do, so you tell me what to do. Amen. And when he tells you, do it. It says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid to do what the Lord commanded him to do. God wants to deal with fear and doubt. And he cannot do that by letting you avoid all the storms in life. We have to go through storms to learn to keep our eyes on him. There's just one more thing, if you'll come. There's just one more thing I want to tell you to assure you as you sail through the storms of life, and it's simply this. Jesus will always see you through the storm. His command was simply, come. And that's not a command that will fail. Not only did Peter and Jesus walk back to that boat together, but when they got there, unlike the other storm experience, you remember the other storm experience after he calmed the storm, they said, they were gripped with fear. They said, what manner of man is this? 
that winds and waves obey him. But not this time. This time, they worshiped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. See, I believe there will be storms that God will bring you through. And when you come through them, they're so bad and they're so difficult that when you come through them, the only thing you can do is bow down and worship him. I noticed that they, they got to the other side. In fact, when they got there, there was such a powerful atmosphere of faith. The Bible says that people brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched him were healed. So their faith grew. But when God brings you through such terrible storms, one of the good things about coming out of a storm is when it's been so bad that all you can do is fall down before him and worship him. Storms perfect your praise. They perfect your worship. And he is worthy of our worship. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If that's what it takes to make me a man of faith who will not doubt, and if that's what it takes to make me worship him better and with all of my heart, let the storms blow. Lead me through the storms that I may worship you even more. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. How many of you are or know someone who's going through a storm right now? Yes. Well, I'm going to pray over your storm, but I want you to know you may just be right smack, right smack dab in the middle of God's will, as we say. And maybe it's just exactly where God wants you because he's perfecting your praise. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for all of the storms of my life. I thank you, God, that you have brought me through every one of them. And I know that you'll bring me through any that I will face in the days ahead. But so many people, so many of your people right now are sailing through the storms and it's been difficult. These storms, it seems like have been long and hard and they just beat against us. But today I pray that we will understand, Lord, that you're interceding for us. Right now, you're calling us to the Father in prayer. And I pray, God, that you will strengthen our faith and take away doubt and remove fear. And I pray, God, that when we come out of the storms, our praise will be powerful. Our worship will be more anointed, that we will bring you more glory in how we worship you and that we will see the miracles that come from the faith that you've grown in us through the storms. Hallelujah. I pray for these people, God, that their faith will not fail and that you will just perfect their praise and lead them into worship in the days ahead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said amen.